Alright, so I'm just getting today's video loaded. I actually did this last evening, I wasn't feeling too shit hot. And then, um, I received an email last evening from a local who filled me in on, on, uh, a lot that's been, a lot that has gone on around my neighborhood. And this may explain some of the items, items, some of the experiences you guys witnessed on my videos while I'm sharing down with the river. Remember some, throwing something at me from the thick bushes there. All the bushes are busted off to the side. You guys seeing some things across the river, etc. A few things are starting to make sense, right? But anyway. So I'm going to go down to the river after I do this. And for tomorrow's video, I'm going to share a bunch of voices down there, including that informative email about what's going on around my community, especially right around my house. And um, um, also, I'm going to, this fog's got a lift. I'm going to share, I'm going to uh, send up the drone from where I share at the river. So I know there's, it's a huge chunk of swamp back in there. I've gone all the way around it in the drift boat, but I'm going to send up the drone and uh, drone the very back of that swamp above the whole line yard so that all of us can see what's going on in there together, what it looks like or how big it is or whatever, right? So I'm going to do that and that will be in tomorrow's upload on here, all right? So here's yesterday's video right now and um, yeah, tomorrow should be very, very interesting. Hopefully I get my freaking truck back today and then I guess I got to get ready to go to the dentist to get this tooth dealt with. Damn it, what a pain in the ass. Anyway, here you go. Back shortly. scare him away. Whew. 
Ooh. All right. I'm back. Healing up. Haven't looked at my ugly mug today. This definitely feels a little different. And I just got back from my last IV. Ugh. I hate needles. My last IV antibiotic treatment. So, um, have some oral antibiotics to finish up and then uh, get to the dentist right away after the weekend, I believe. And that's all good. Anyway, bigger, better news. For the curious, I went, uh, I made Sarah get up this morning at 5 30 or whatever and dragged her with me and I went looking for that great big bull elk. I knew there's, I know there, I videotaped this one bull elk last year and I was hoping to find him again. I was hope, really hoping I could call him up and get him to come into me in that green rainforest, you know, that real wicked awesome backdrop and and use my quality camera and see if I might be able to get some epic video of a absolute gargantuan monster Roosevelt bull elk. I've been trying to do that. Left a few cameras and then uh, hasn't been working out. But I knew there was another one. I knew there was another big bull. And uh, maybe two. They're very nomadic though, these bulls. They're not that territorial. So, But I knew there, was, there should be a very large bull. And I picked a couple trails. I only had a few cameras the other day. And I think I went out there a week ago, or a little bit over a week ago, and there's nothing. Anyways, we, we checked the camera this morning, and bingo! Found them. It's exciting for me. It's just exciting for me. I, when you know, when you know there has just got to be a monster right here, you know, and it draws me bonkers. It happens with deer, too, and I'll start looking, and I can't stop myself, and I'll just obsess. And I'll keep snooping and looking and snooping and looking until I find them. And then if I can, I'll try even harder and get my eyes on them and videotape them. Or if it's huntable area, I'll harvest them and tag them. But I don't have a tag. It's a dry area. But it's just as much fun for me to, to challenge myself to go out and find that big bull. So anyways, here he is. I found a huge one. And then I checked another camera, and the young bull that I called right into Sarah in front of her in the, in the valley bottom of the creek. I caught him on a trail camera, and another one, and then we got this other mature guy on uh, camera as well. And he put on a display every 15 minutes for a couple hours. Pretty cool. And that went down. So, oh my truck. Lots of babbling today, right? And then my truck, poor guy, the poor mechanic, apparently there was a, um, apparently there was a uh, computer component that tells the fuel or the fuel pump what to do, apparently, and that thing was kaputs. So that was a problem why they kept on thinking it was the fuel pump. So that's getting done. Hopefully get it back today. I hope. Because this no truck thing is really sucking. Now, let's get some voices heard, more important than mine. What do we got? Who's here today waiting patiently for who knows how long? All right, here we go. This is titled Stories from Iowa and Colorado. Steve. That's what I share a couple of encounters I personally had and want to know if you've heard from others in Iowa. I know we're not a hot spot area like many other places, but Bigfoot is here is also here. Both my experiences happened where there was a river or a creek, lots of wooded areas right there or close by, and an easy source of food. My parents had built a large, at the time, chicken confinement operation, and I was working for them. Laying in bed one night, the house was right by the complex, had the window open, which was six feet off the ground. And I hear what sounds like chattering slash human, but not human sounds coming directly in the window. I was too terrified to look. It went on for a few to look and it went on for a few minutes. But here's the kicker. My brother lived less than a quarter mile away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when I mentioned it to his wife, 
she said they had heard the same thing about the same time and their two-year-old son woke up screaming for absolutely no reason. Keep in mind this complex did have unburied chicken carcasses waiting to be incinerated or buried. Fast forward a few years later. Same brother was renting some farm ground pretty much directly across the river from our farm. It had a beautiful creek with pasture ground and still plenty of tree cover. I would go over after I got off work around 10 p.m. and pull into the pasture with my truck, close the gate and sit in the bed of my truck looking at the stars. One night I'm minding my own business and I hear something coming directly for my truck. Really, really, really heavy labored breathing. And then a noise I'll never forget is a combination of a scream, a growl, and something else it's hard to describe. Whatever it was, it was big, all within 10 yards of my truck. I'm terrified, in the bed of my truck, trying to figure out how to get back into the cab without being ripped into pieces by who knows what. I finally decided to jump out and jump into the truck, still terrified. I turned on the headlights and nothing was there. Nothing at all. Creepy thing is, I've never heard it leave. I never heard it leave. It was just gone. And as a side note, I've never gone back, back to a food source. The guy that owned the property was a taxidermist and he had a pit of sorts where he would put the excess, excess parts he wasn't using. It's been interesting for me to hear they aren't too picky about the condition of their food source. Not at all. Zero. Zero concern for freshness of what they will consume. That's a fact. Fast forward again, I'm in Colorado with my other brother, who was a Bigfoot researcher. And he knew a spot around Colorado Springs that had a lot of activity. So off we go to a Forest Service road about five miles in looking for signs. We saw some tree breaks, and then came upon a rock by the side of the road that didn't belong there. It was too big for one person to carry. And as we looked around the area, we couldn't find anything similar to it at all. We both found small and large footprints around the rock and going across the road. We also found a tree structure, and as we were getting ready to leave the woods, knock started. Across the years, I've gotten over being afraid, I think, of all of it, and just more curious. I'm very matter of fact when I say anything about it. Thanks for providing a forum for people to discuss their experiences. P.S. Please don't use my name, it would be much appreciated. Okay, I gotcha. I gotcha. Welcome to the club. <laughs> it's good to hear you're not, you don't think you're too scared. That's a good thing, right? It's better than being terrified and not being able to do all this stuff anymore. Do anything anymore. All right, here we go again. Here we go again. If anything, I'm getting these voices heard, right? Now, Mark, this is red. I'm struggling if I should go bear hunting right now or do this, but I think I'd rather do this. i got a big day ahead of me tomorrow, and I'm praying my truck's going to be ready to pick up. And at least within the hour, anyway. Strange Experience in Cornfields, the title of this email. I see you've found your channel after listening to your first conversation with Nino. Since listening to so many accounts and experiences, I realized that something that happened to myself and a friend 20 years ago, which I wrote off as just strange, was maybe something more significant. I live in northeastern Illinois, close to the Wisconsin border. One evening close to dusk, my friend asked me if I wanted to go with her to a nearby corn feed corn field to grab a few ears of corn for her wild critters, so I obliged. There's a dirt path to walk into the field. My friend cut into some rows first, and I went further up, about 10 yards or so from her, and then cut into the rows. About five minutes later, we both shot out from where we were, back onto the path in complete panic and fear. Note, neither of us had called out to each other, nor were we t talking while in the cornfield. It was like we both just got a message at the exact same time. We looked at each other for a split second and hauled ass to her vehicle. 
It was like something told us both to get out. We started the car, quickly took off, saying, what the hell was that about? I remember telling my then boyfriend about it, and he said a farmer that he knew as a kid had died in that area decades ago, and it was probably him trying to warn us of something out there, like a coyote. At the time, I believed him. But now, after hearing so many people's experiences, I think maybe it could have been something else. My friend and I were never spoke about it again after that evening. Thank you for all you do to bring things to light. So grateful to have found your channel. And thanks, Nino. Barb. Okay, Barb. Well, there's two patterns there. Number one is the panic feeling and, this, and the uh, message to get the hell out and get out of there. And number two pattern that I see there is you and your friend never spoke of it again. Why is that? Isn't that weird? So weird. Now, who's next? Man, this getting sick and truck breaking down and all this other shit happened. Just put me behind so far on what I want to get done. I gotta get a hold of Nino, let him know I forgot about him. I got another guy in BC. I got he texted me back and I haven't texted him back yet. I gotta find his text and text him back and get a hold of him to come on here and talk, hopefully with me on here in front of us. All. Another person who sent me a whole pile of information that they've acquired and a whole pile of emails sent that to me and it's hunting. And I haven't had a time to get all those emails and organize them in one place and go through them. So much. It's just a chaotic time of year for me. It's not a good time to get sick and have breakdowns either. It's just bad luck. Anyway, sorry about my rant. Let's get on to the more important voices. This is titled Story. Hi, Steve. I've been following you for about five or six years. I'm writing from England. I can see the correlation between national parks and sightings and experiences. I can see that so-called anomalous rock formations and cave systems suggest remnants of previous advanced civilizations and therefore an inconvenient hidden true history. My mother was clairvoyant and my daughter is also gifted and I have, a, and I have had plenty of woo-woo experiences over the years. The experience I had could have gone unnoticed had I not been a regular viewer of your channel. I was hiking in the new forest <clears throat> in the new sorry in the one more time I was hiking in the new forest in the south of England with a friend last summer mid-August and the temperature at night was 17 degrees Celsius. We were deep in the forest and came across a wide glade with flat grass making a really nice location for an overnight camp. It's not permitted to camp anywhere other than designated, busy and expensive campsites which seemed unnatural and definitely unfair. We were considerate of nature and would leave no trace to be gone in the early, in the early morning. We picked in the twilight, kept our conversations very low and limited. The surroundings were magical and everything seemed mysterious in a nice way. We retired from hiking all day and soon went into our separate tents. I woke up around 2 or 3 to relieve myself. I noticed how cold it was and a loud knocking which echoed through the woods. Another knocking soon followed from another direction. As I got out of the tent I saw that... I Sorry. As I got out of the tent I saw that a herd of about a dozen ponies had surrounded our campsite. We were in very thick, spooky mist. I peed and remembered to mind speak. We're no threat, we're just passing through. Help us feel relaxed and good about sleeping. I remember feeling really tranquil, almost sedated, and I slept like a baby. Let me go back to that one more time. A herd of about a dozen ponies had surrounded our campsite. All right, we read it correctly. My hiking buddy slept through with no clue. In the morning, the ponies were gone, with a few grazing further up through the trees. As we were packing up, a stallion came galloping straight at us, bucking and rearing, but was kind of playful. As we discussed our next move, a policeman on a horse came straight through the trees to ask to us and asked if we had camped. 
As we were packed, we said, no, we're just resting and moving on. He reminded us that a warden would like to prosecute anyone who camped in the forest, and if we were to camp, then to do so on a regula regulated campsite. <laughs> you couldn't imagine having answered anybody, myself, to go sleep in the woods. I, just can't, I can't picture it. I'd have a tough time with that. It was only when I heard a First Nation guy on your platform say about deer surrounding him in a thick mist that nailed it. I definitely had a real encounter. Like I needed a verification in my own mind, although I knew at the time what had happened in the, in the night. The forest was full of signs, X's structures, snap branches, the works. I've since been on the South Downs, another national park in Woodland, lots of sign there also. All the best, Steve. Certainly, the world is very different from what we have been led to believe. Thanks, mate. From your English English brother, Mark. Okay, Mark, appreciate you chucking that forward. And uh, I'm guessing if you ask around there, ask around that neighborhood, somebody's going to come up with something for you. That's some kind of experience, what I'm saying, without a doubt. We get a lot, a lot from your country. Here's another one. A possible puzzle piece. Hello, Steve. I'll be quick. You asked why these beings were always seen in creeks. Also, you also say to everybody, go outside barefoot and ground yourself to the earth. I do believe these two things go hand in hand. There's something called the my mycelium network. It is how trees communicate with each other. There's a network of fungi. The mycelium network is huge. It spans the entirety of the forest. It will send electrical impulses to each other about food disturbances and even has partial memory and problem solving. It is a vast organism wrapped around tree roots and plant roots. Scientists have broken down the electrical impulses and it is structured like human language. I urge everyone to read up on it. It is amazing. I don't think there are as many mycelia underwater or in creeks, or maybe there are none at all. Possibly the electric impulses cannot be felt through the bottom of the foot as well, if that's how they're receiving information. Also, if they're hitting a tree, they're sending a huge electric impulse through the forest. And if they are grounded, it almost seems it would be like an echolocation of electric impulses being sent out and received back into their foot. It's just a guess, man. I know elephants have been recorded seeking higher ground before a tsunami. I wish everybody the best. Take from what you will. Okay, every little bit counts, man. You got the wheels turning big time. You never know, because that is, that is one of the larger mysteries for me. One of them. One of the mysteries when it comes to just a simple information in a way about these things and the patterns we know is um, I do realize that there is some kind of, what is it called, the Achilles, their Achilles heel may be following a creek bed or a river bed. Because including my late past grandfather and many, many other people, how many people have we heard they're walking a creek bed or river bed and surprise these beings? Very rarely is one of these bush people standing there looking at you as you're coming up a river creek bed. River bed, creek bed, which they are in too. It's always a face-to-face, -face, whoa, right? Or you come up and look down and there it was in the creek, stooped over the water, right? So many times. So there you go. You never know, right? You never know. And if that is holding any kind of a water, then you got to think about it. How do these beings know to stop dead frozen the second your eyes lock onto them when they're walking away from you? How do they know that one? Right? How do they know that one? Okay, before I battle, I can go on on that topic. The wheels are turning. Appreciate you sending that in. I love it. I love to hear about people's wheels turning and thinking and trying to figure shit out. Okay, here we go. Who do we got? What do we got? This one's got a fill it with it, I think. Hi, Steve. Not much of a story, but this picture was taken by my cell trail camera in Halifax County 
outside of Enfield, North Carolina, where I hunt on this farm this past August. The camera is over five feet off the ground, so I know it's not a deer or a bear. Our, bar our bears, our, excuse me, our bears here are black, not brown. Plus, they have pointed ears, as you know, like deer do. This looks to be the back of a head with one ear. The picture next to it was solid white, like something blocked the lens out when it saw the IR beam it transmits. But I have my camera set to take two pictures, so this is the second picture. I know what it isn't, and I think I know what it is. Plus, it was taken at like 1.25 a.m. Plus, no one knows where this camp is but me. We have heard, we have heard wood knocks there, also. Plus, I contacted a local Sasquatch research channel here that posted it with this same story and a guy contacted me yesterday and wanted to know where I hunted in Halifax County because he was aware and had a sighting himself there, among with three or four more people that saw them in the same area. And the Sasquatches were brown to blonde like the one in the picture being the camera. Sorry, there's typos here all through it. We're brown to blonde like the one in the picture being the camera is only five feet off the ground. I'm guessing it's a juvenile. Feel free to use my name, Johnny Steiferman, Sims, North Carolina, USA. Love your channel, no bullshit, just the truth. It amazes me that this, that this being one of the clearest pictures you will see of one and people are still in denial. One of them could bite these non-believers in the ass and they still wouldn't believe in them. I definitely do. All right, and there's the photo. Do I know what that is? Nope. No, I don't. Do I believe it is one of these unacknowledged people? I haven't a clue. For me, I never tell anybody what they want to hear. <laughs> and I don't try to offend anyone either, but to me that is that looks like either elk or moose fur to me. First off, that's what that looks like to me. If I if I seen that on my trail camera, I'm gonna go, oh, what is that? Moose or elk neck? What is that? But what's that weird distortions? Anyway, so I haven't a clue, man. I haven't a clue. It might be, might not be, but that's a shitty deal about photographs, right? You gotta admit, it's a shitty deal about photographs. Trail cameras. Don't know. Don't know. All right, shared, shared, shared. Appreciate you sending that in, man. I'm glad you are. Uh, I'm glad you're aware of what's really going on out there, right? <laughs> glad. I'm glad you're a member of the club and no return, right there beside us. This next one is titled "Magic Touch Slash Land of, Enta of Enchantment Slash." Native wisdom. All right, here we go. Hi, Steve. My name is Dash Down, aka Dave Ashdown. You can use my name. It's just rock and roll. I've been hooked on this channel for close to two years, and have been a Sabe believer since I was a little kid, though I'd never had an encounter. But the experience I'm going to share with you definitely seems to jibe with a lot of the stories you read for us here. Back in 2019, I took a trip to Taos, New Mexico. Man, I hope I pronounced that the right way. Taos, Taos, because I guided a wildlife biologist years ago from there. And he had a big impact on my outdoor life. I spent a couple weeks with him guiding him. Got a huge, massive record book moose. His name was Stet Edmonds from Taos, Taos. And he passed away. Anyway, sorry for that. Every time I hear of that town, that's what I think of. Back in 2019, I took a trip to Taos, New Mexico to visit a native friend. I stayed at the cheapest Airbnb in the state. 33 bucks for a cot in an old converted ice cream truck. No way. To cut to it, I got a spooky feeling when I was sitting outside. The thicket to my right up against the front of the truck had my attention. It got real quiet. I found myself unable to light a candle in glass. After several attempts, it kept going out, but there was no wind. I'd lit the candle before and knew it wasn't defective or anything. It's a candle. 
Anyway, I decided to retire early. Was concerned I might not be able to sleep real well on this narrow cot. And because the temperature seriously dips down at that elevation at night, I had a heavy granny blanket over me and I was overheating. Right around then, my brother texted me in response to some photos I'd sent him saying, Look squatchy out there, man. Good luck falling asleep. Thanks, bro. Not. In that moment, I was struck with an image that had me a little freaked. That of a giant Sabe putting his face up against the rear window of the truck for me to see him or her. It wasn't there, but it was in my mind, and I couldn't shake the image. As I brought the blanket up with my right arm to cover me more, that giant hand pushed my right arm back down, though softly. I freaked the F out, bouncing up and yelling, Who's there? No one had boarded the ice cream truck. I'd been wide awake the whole time. The hair in my entire body was standing up, including my ankles, which has never happened in my life. As I write this, my skin is tingling. I tried to calm myself down and thought to myself, should I stay or should I go? And with that, the entire ice cream truck lurched forward and then back. That was it. I was out the door in my boxers with my phone, wallet, jeans, and a t-shirt in hand, and into the rental car and gone into the night. I nearly ran over the Airbnb owner's dog in the process. Lucky I saw him there in the dirt driveway and he got out of the way. When I came back for my belongings the next day, I was shocked to find I could not, with all my might, make the truck rock at all, not even a budge. When I saw my native friend the next day, she took one look at me and said, Without my having told her anything about the night before, no bullshit, she says, What happened to you? I thought you were staying out by the mountain. You been messing around with the Sasquatch? Dumbfounded, I kind of nodded. Yeah, I guess. Maybe I... Oops, sorry. She looked at me, paused, and added point blank, They, knew, they know you are here, silly. They don't have to take physical form. They are real. They are a peoples. We celebrate them in our songs and our ceremonies. They have abilities we don't have. And there you have it, Steve. As I think about it now, I believe the Sabe knew I couldn't handle the visual, but wanted to let me know of his slash her presence. It was a mellow howdy. I say this because the next day I took a hike in the mountains only to come across Two giant snapped branches placed in an X blocking the trail. I could just step over it, but I got kind of the message in my head and thought, and I found myself saying softly, slowly, but loud, If you walk past this X and something bad happens, you only have myself to blame. I turned around, headed back, back the other way. Later that afternoon, I went on my first ever sweat lodge and threw my guts up twice on my hands and knees, exhausted and drooling in the desert dirt. I never felt better in my life. Maybe Sabe's got the magic touch. New Mexico certainly is the land of enchantment. Thanks, Steve. Rock and roll, Dave. Okay, man. There you go. <laughs> Who knows what did it? Airbnb in a frickin' truck and a cot. <laughs> Holy shit. I've never heard of that one before. There you go. The indigenous people know. You listen to the indigenous people now, right? Should have been listening to them all from day one. Who's next? This is titled, Your Question, Science Education. Hey Steve. Hold on, I'm getting a little comfortable here. Hey Steve, you asked how the views of graduated scientists on their education have changed following your channel. I am a nuclear physicist. Six years university in Europe with lots of hiking experience in California and Washington State. In short, physics covers all the natural foundations and forces like electromagnetism, uh, sorry, electromagnetism, gravitation, nuclear, subnuclear, quantum physics, radioactivity, matter slash antimatter. 
So all other sciences like chemistry, biology, etc. are based on fundamental principles of physics. So far, the experiences you shared have not contradicted the science that is taught in global universities. It just, did not, it just does not cover the science of mind speak, portals, cloaking, movement, overcoming gravity, etc. So it is just incomplete, not wrong. That makes it so exciting for scientists to learn from everybody's experience. If you keep an open, if you keep an open mind, keep it up. All right, I appreciate you writing in, and maybe I'll add to it. If you keep an open mind, and if you don't try to go public with it to your, to your North American colleagues, otherwise they'll try to shit all over your career, your character, your life, and annihilate you. And that's a proven fact. But a different topic. Anyway, I appreciate you sending that in. Big time replying to my question. I remember asking that question, too. Um, on that note, Edgar sh also shared with me the other day that his colleague who they shared their conversation with each other with me so I could share with you guys. Do you remember that one? Where he was taken into the mountains in Russia with an indigenous man and basically is confident he met these beings. He said to Edgar, not to me, he said to Edgar that this being allowed him to touch his arm and his leg also showed him how his temperature, he could change his temperature to almost boiling to, to freezing cold to the touch instantly. Very interesting, right? Very interesting. Anyway, get this one. So don't forget, Edgar and this man are both in the nuclear department and they're very, very careful, very diligent in their movements and are absolutely confident they never touched anything at work, never screwed up at all. But meanwhile, Edgar, since his experience, has had been battling this cancer. Well, here's some unfortunate news. Guess who just had notification that he has the same cancer? His colleague, who met the being in Russia. What's up with that? Right? What's up with that? And I do believe is a separate contact, not Edgar and his colleague, who, yes, I know who he is. I bet we keep him, his name, not mentioned. But there's a third scientist, is, is another different, not even connected with, these, with Edgar or his colleague, who told me about seeing one of these beings looking up in the security camera in the nuclear installation, whether it be a missile silo, or reactor, I forget. All I remember is that he was curious and took the Geiger counter to the footprints and he got a reading off of them. The footprints in the compound, the footprints of the eight to 10 foot tall being, whatever it was, is standing there looking up at him through the security camera. That's something to be concerned about. Also, I had a little bit of concerns about my knife. Possibly. Do I have a Geiger counter? Nope. No, I don't. So. We'll see. But anyway, another, another topic. I decided to pass that on. That's some unfortunate news that was received with my last um, conversation with Edgar. And uh, we are working on the three of us getting together, just so you know. Just so you know. Now, still no phone call about my trunk. Let's see what else we got in here. All right, here's another one. I think this is an older email. And it's titled Alberta. That's the title of this email. It starts off with, Hey Mike, I've been listening watching your, and watching your video for some time now and enjoy hearing the vast amount of amazing stories to listen to that you share. I believe this story may be worthy of sharing with the listeners. This is how it goes. All right, well, there's no mic here. My name's Steve, <laughs> and uh, I believe that was a typo. Or we have Mike's email, and we're about to read it anyway. My friend and I spent the, the weekend camping at Rock Lake in Algonquin Park, Ontario, Canada, one summer, about five years ago. We were using my green laser pointer to, a, to point 
at a ton of objects we observed moving about and flashing lights in the sky as if they were communicating with each other. So after this amazing experience, we left the beach at about 11 p.m. and hit the tent to sleep. It, ha it was a two room with a big screen front with a big front screen porch for bugs. We settled in for the night, put the fire out and went to sleep, sort of. I awoke to my zippers on my tent being open. At whatever time it was, it was still pitch black out. I had my eyes still closed, thinking it was my friend next to me who maybe woke up to take a leak. He enjoyed drinking, so he had a bit of a buzz on. I thought it was him staggering over to the wrong side of the tent. I heard a long zip, then another long zip, and you know when camping. And you know when camping, I like to meet the zippers in the middle. Anyways, I said out loud, hey, Brad, wrong side, bro, as I heard the zipping of the tent door opening. I repeated, but louder, hey, Brad. No response. So I opened my eyes. And to my total absolute terrifying sight was some creature which looked like it was half in the tent crouched down like a human would that dropped something on a floor and was effing staring at me face to face with huge glowing green eyes. I freaked out and slapped the tent floor and ground as hard as I could and like a bullet this creature took off into the darkness with branches and shit breaking. Now I have camped solo since, but not there. I can't even honestly say what the hell it was, but I've never heard of an animal nicely opening the zipper of a tent. I'll tell you what, I was scared. Over the years, thinking what this could be, I narrowed it down into the cryptozoology category and ufology. Number one, an alien or an ET entity. Number two, an adolescent Sasquatch. Final conclusion, whatever it was, it was curious and looking at me and did not harm me. That sure startled the shit out of me. Cheers. Hope you like this true event story. Thanks for sharing. Rick Clausen, currently living in Edmonton, Alberta. I attached photos I took in an area called David Thompson Country. This is an area known for Sasquatch sightings. And I solo hike here frequently, but have yet to see or hear any yet. All right. There you go. I'll just try to hold that right there. It's your typical typical Rocky Mountain scene. Looks like Jasper to me, Jasper, Banff area. There you go. Canadian Rocky Mountains. And a terrifying frickin' experience. Who wants to have that go down? That's a ball. That's, a, that's not a smart move either, right? It's just not a smart move, especially today. You don't want to sneak up to a human being's camp, tent in the dark and even touch it, let alone unzip the door. <laughs> yeah, I've got, when I cl climb in my tent, there's always a loaded magnum there beside me. Always. You have a loaded magnum, rifle, or a uh, sawed-off shot, a shortened shotgun with a buckshot, slug, buckshot, slug in it, with the plug taken out. And that's the number one stopper of anything in North America, is that right there. The 12 gauge with slugs and buckshot. Number one stopper. Anyway, I was going to tell you guys something, damn it. And I'm forgetting what. It's bugging me. I have a lot I need to do and think about and plan. And i got, I got to get back on track and i got to get caught up. Now that my face, my elephant Titus is finally going away pain's manageable and then I think I've got to go through my oral antibiotics and then I got to get to the dentist after this weekend so there anyway share my story at howtohunt.com all right get your get your knowledge out get it shared and in the meantime I'm going to share with you guys what I did with the drone this morning show you what I saw and um and maybe after tomorrow, maybe tomorrow I'll be making a very cool video in the middle of nowhere tomorrow. Might be a possibility too. Obviously, I gotta get off, I gotta get off of this right now because I'm bad with my brain's going up there. I got shit to do and shit to get caught up on. 
but I'll be back shortly. A little more organized and a lot more important stuff to get across to everybody. Soon. Later.